So on one of your slides, uh, moral hazard is, you, you take a look at it and get into some detail about moral hazard. Um, and related, and I'll tie it together with my ultimate question, but you also mentioned that um, perhaps it's preferable to uh, just kind of get, eliminate something, bl you blow up something, and then start fresh if it's a legacy system that's not functioning as it should. So that's I have- good, that, but That's a great software analogy. Every now and then, the software has just turned into bloatware and you need to throw it out and, and write it from scratch. Um, I'm looking I, at you, Adobe Acrobat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a background in, well, at the intersection of healthcare and economics. Um, so moral hazard in the healthcare industry refers to when a third party is paying for someone else's healthcare, people will use more healthcare, which creates other problems. Um, uh, well, sorry, I guess what I'm getting at is it's an industry, like the healthcare industry specifically is an industry that cannot be turned off. It is running 24 7 continuously, and I don't, I, I, it would be great to just blow it up and start fresh, but co considering that it can't be like shut off and services are required at any given point, um, I'm curious to see like what you suggest about. Okay, there's a slide <laughs> on it. Okay. We're not going to do it, uh, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. About it. So there's, there's two things you, you said that I want to uh, key on. So m let's explain the concept of moral hazard. You got it exactly. If you're insured, uh, then you tend, not to, uh, uh, you, you tend not to take enough care, and you tend to overuse uh, services. Uh, you know, oh, I have an ingrown toenail. Let's go see the podiatrist uh, kind of thing. That's exactly the mechanism that happens in uh, financial markets. Um, in financial markets, um, uh, if you know the Fed is going to come bail everybody out. So I think it's pretty darn clear that in pandemic 3.0, where they're going to do exactly what they did in pandemic 2.0, they're going to come bail everybody out. So why should, well, for example, they bailed out, I said they bailed out the treasury markets. What happened in the treasury markets was the traders weren't keeping enough cash around. So when there was a big, a lot of people wanted to, wanted to uh, uh, sell treasuries, the, the traders didn't have enough cash to buy them, so the Fed stepped in. Well, why should you keep extra cash on your balance sheet ready to jump in when you know the Fed's going to jump in any time? That's an example of the moral hazard. Why should you a company? So you're a company. You're like an airline. So airlines got bailed out this time. Now, there's two ways to run an airline. One way to run an airline is you keep a lot of cash hanging around, and you, you mostly finance with equity, and, and it's... You pay a little more for doing that, but if all of a sudden there's a pandemic, you make it through the pandemic. The other way to do things is to borrow like crazy, always live on the, on the edge, that you make a little more profit in the good times, and of course, in the bad times, you're out of business, except in the bad times, the government comes and bails you out. <laughs> so the fact of anticipating a bailout means that everybody is borrowing too much money and doesn't have the, the resources to go in. You know, your, your fire sale is my buying opportunity. So the strategy of, of sit around, keep some dry powder, and, and wait to buy on the dips. Well, there won't be any dips anymore because you kind of know the government's going to come in. So that's the moral hazard. And it, it makes the financial system riskier because that natural buffer isn't there. It's sort of like if we have too good of a firehouse, then, then people leave gasoline in the basement and, and don't make sure to have fire extinguishers. Uh, so that's the financial version of it. Health, um, I'll say I'm not going to be able to do health care, but next year. Uh, uh, health there is also a very simple ideal system. It's one where you pay. Uh, heavens, you actually have to pay for health care the way you do for contractors, tax lawyers, or any other personal service. Uh, and you face brutally competitive supply, which is out there trying to give you good stuff at low prices. And you have health insurance, which is mostly catastrophic. Health insurance is there to protect your wallet, not to protect your life. It gives you the resources to be able to buy uh, health insurance. And it's portable and flexible, and, it, and you take it with you. You buy it. Your employer doesn't buy it. This is why we don't have that is another old lady in a fly story, which I won't tell you. But what I will, I do want to answer your question. Getting to there doesn't, again, doesn't require that we close the hospitals. <laughs> it requires that we allow competition in new hospitals. It's really about changing a payment system rather than, than closing down hospitals and telling them that, you know, everybody, everybody dies for a month until we change this. And, and the same is true of the financial system. Open it up to competition is, is, it does not mean you have to close everything down in the meantime. Yeah, in the back. Um, given the picture you painted here, the 
uh, eviction moratorium feels a bit like smoking a cigarette at a gas station. What do you anticipate is going to be the fallout here when this uh, gets lifted? Well, the eviction moratorium is, uh, that's actually on the, <laughs> man, I always overprepare. That's on the taxes uh, <laughs> question, really. There's a temptation in one of the other, uh, there's the old lady in the fly, there's the two-year-old with the hammer, and, and the temptation to a, uh, quote, one-time capital tax is a big original sin. Uh, so this, this is the problem with rent control. Once people are in apartments and, and you, the government, don't feel like passing taxes to subsidize renters, you just say, well, the landlord has to pay the renter. Uh, and that works for a year or two until landlords don't build any, house, any apartments <laughs> and they slowly kick the renters out. And then guess what? There's a, there's a rental crisis. Uh, rent controls are the easiest way short of bombing to destroy a city. And I think the eviction moratorium has much of the same. I mean, so evictions serve a purpose. Uh, if you can't evict anybody, nobody ever pays any rent. If nobody ever pays any rent, then landlords can't build or uh, have apartment houses. And the worst thing of it is, is of course, it, uh, it, like minimum wages, it hurts. Who does it hurt? It hurts the person who wants to rent a house. The young... Who gets, the, the kid from Fresno who wants to come to the Bay Area and, and get a job and kind of move up in life, well, right now it's really hard to get an apartment. Why? Because the apartments are full of people who aren't paying any rent, and uh, new apartments are not, you know, this is, uh, this is now hanging over your head that uh, new apartments won't get built. So I, I want to encourage thinking about the incentives rather than uh, the justice of it all. I feel terrible for someone who's been kicked out, too, but... Unless you can eventually kick people out, um, it just makes it harder. And what it means is that people right now already, dubious people find it really hard to get apartments. So to get an apartment, you've probably rented an apartment more recently than I have, right? You have to show income, a job, stability, great credit reference. What happens to people kind of on the lower end of society who might not have great credit and who might have been kicked out of a house or apartment before or might, be, might have been in jail a year ago. Those people are the ones who can't get housing now because landlords have to be super careful about who they let in because they know they can't kick anybody out afterwards. So it's uh, one with rent control. Of course, it was, it was, uh, it was just a shock. There's, there's a rule of law question. Uh, this was passed under the, under the idea that it was a way to stop the spread of COVID. Uh, and I'm sorry, if you call yourself science-based, let, let's see any way of defending that as actually stopping the spread of COVID. Because people are allowed to go out and go to bars. Uh, so I don't know how that has anything to do with stopping COVID. It's just a, a dramatic violation of rule of law. But don't get me going. Uh, let's see. This side of the room hasn't asked a question yet. Yes, please. Yes. Um yeah, I would um, just, Professor Cochran, yeah, I'd just like to um, ask like, um, whether you would, com in terms of talking about ideas about banking that are even less politically plausible than, um, than the narrow banking or um, equity-based banking that you propose, um, whether you're familiar with um, George Selgin and his idea of free banking, um, and who had you know, more of an optimistic take, I'd say, on fractional reserve banking in the 19th century in particular, and you argued that a lot of the crises that the U.S. in particular saw were due to fractional reserve banking, and you know, oftentimes proposals for free banking are paired with kind of ideas to free to have a much more passive, you know, monetary policy, um, and and perhaps it could have applications, in, you know, cr credit, um, building a credit superstructure on various ki kinds of cryptocurrency and that kind of thing. I mean, I can see where you know where free banking may take a lot of risks um, in terms of it, where your proposal does not. But I was just wondering, like, um, whether um, whether you had um, comments on that proposal. So yeah. Uh I love George. He's a wonderful guy, but I think he's off base on this. There's a whole school of thought that, you know, Scotland in the 1790s was the epitome of the wonderful banking system, and we just need to go back to that. There's a school of thought that says the gold standard is the most wonderful thing in the world. We just have to go back to that. Uh, I don't think either is deals with the realities of the modern, the realities and the opportunities of the modern uh, financial system. Uh, so, no, in part. So there's this, there was this problem in the 1700s of, let's call it a lack of currency, a lack of money. 
So there's gold coins, but they're kind of like heavy. So you need pieces of paper are a better technology for making transactions. Who is going to make those pieces of paper? Well, to have value, the pieces of paper have to be backed by something in the end. And so we had developed a system where pieces of paper backed by loans to farmers and houses created a money supply which allowed us to make transactions. We don't need that anymore. Uh, because So our, our government debt is not safe in the sense that it could inflate, but it's the safest things we got in the sense of there won't be explicit default on government debt. We got $25 trillion of government debt out there. So uh, there's potentially $25 trillion of interest-paying money. Uh, the problem of uh, how do you create some money, we just don't have that. If we simply liquefy the government debt, we have money that is completely, that, that never can have a run or a crisis again. So I, I think it's a it's lovely piece of economic history. I gather Scottish free banking worked better than the London banking system in the 1800s. But we have this wonderful opportunity, call it crypto, whether it's central ledger or decentral ledger, uh, electronic interest paying money backed by nominal government debt is a wonderful thing. And, and we, we don't need to have banks create money for us anymore. We need banks to make loans. That's what they're good at. And to get the money making loans in a way that doesn't engender the financial system. And then we never have a crisis again. So short answer is very nice, but not adapted to today's technology or financial situation. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on other, you know, banking systems? Like, for example, the Islamic banking system, where they have much stricter rules about, you know, usury and, and making loans than, uh, you know, the American or the Western sort of system. In, uh, let's see, when was it? I think it was about uh, 1410. Cosimo Pater Patriae de Medici faced a similar problem. The problem was the church didn't allow the payment of interest. So here's what he did. You couldn't pay interest, but what you could do is you could buy for Florence in Florence a bill of exchange that would pay you in Bruges six months from now, whatever the currency there was. You could also buy a forward contract that would, uh, that would take um, money from Bruges and return it to Florentine Florence, and you'd end up with about 6% more Florentine Florence with these overlapping self-canceling foreign exchange contracts. And that now you know where all the beautiful paintings in the Uffizi came from, that and, and lending money to popes. So, uh, you know, non, non -pay, just from an economic financial point of view, so I'm not Islamic, and uh, from a, I just don't see any point to not paying interest or to coming up with contrivances that make it seem like you're not paying interest. And that's all I know about Islamic banking, which is not much. If you know more, uh, ask a different question. Are we all exhausted? I thought you were going to ask about you know, um, the fact that there's payday lending and there's this whole kind of underbelly of a sector that is uh, lending people money at rates that seem really you know, uncouth, but yet people still use these services. So where do, where, where do we go with that? Yeah, that is, that is an interesting, because of course, um, we, we have usury limits. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, and like any price control, um, what tends to happen is if you say you, you can't do that, then the people who need it most don't get any credit at all. So uh, are we better off with uh, people getting no credit at all? Now, there's a sort of paternalistic aspect to it. Maybe they should learn to save a little more. Uh, but if you are about to get back when evictions happened, if you needed the payday loan to make the rent or get evicted, it was awfully nice to be able to go get the payday loan. Uh, there, is a, there's a deep, there is a problem of sort of, uh, I like to use the words, Americans experiencing lower income, because we, we don't say you're not our, I don't like to use our lower income, because nobody is permanently lower income. But Americans in difficulty uh, seem to be right on the edge financially a lot. Um, and uh, 
that, that doesn't give you pleasant opportunities. Uh, but I don't have an easy answer for that. Unless you do, Josh. I'm always willing to listen and, and say maybe yes, ma'am. Yeah, you certainly do. Well, thank you for being here, Professor. Uh, the two, I suppose, big sectors or, or themes of the talk, at least from the billing name, was uh, about the financial sector and then also climate change. You'd mentioned the latter uh, briefly within one of the slides, but if at all, what role do you, does the financial sector have in addressing climate change? A big role. Uh, the financial sector, uh, I hope, will be through venture capital, uh, financing innovation, which is the only hope for actually doing something about climate change. Um, and uh, the financial sector's job is to issue equity and, and finance um, uh, worthy projects that are in the name of climate change. Now, we're kind of going in, a, in an unfortunate direction, um, um, which is not informed by climate science or cost-benefit analysis. So headlong central banks by regulation trying to defund fossil fuels before there are alternatives in place uh, strikes me as not very good finance, uh, not very good climate policy, because in part, central bankers have no expertise in climate policy. You know, our, our climate policy to actually, should, I, John Lornberg should be here, but the only climate policy is going to work is, is possibly a carbon tax. Okay. Possibly carbon tax, a massive amount of innovation uh, is, is the uh, thing that's going to work. Uh, and nuclear power, things you're not allowed to say. Nuclear power, guess what? Nuclear power doesn't release carbon. Um, we should carbon capture and storage, geoengineering, all, all sorts of things that you're not allowed to say out loud in, in the rush to, uh, to put in today's technology. Think of what we're doing. It's, it's like in 1920, suppose people were sitting around saying, what should the cars of 2024 look like? And we're sitting around now saying, what should the cars of 2124 look like? Uh, and, and that kind of... Uh, deciding on technologies by central bankers and then funding them or not funding was a particularly ineffective way to run climate policy. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just wondering if you have any insights as to why some prominent central bankers like uh, Mark Carney, for instance, have become so fixated on the uh, climate change as a uh, systematic risk perspective. Okay, so there is no systemic risk due to climate change. Can we get that straight? This is a fantasy. Let me, let me define terms. So climate is the probability distribution of the weather. Financial regulation can look maybe five years ahead to see what happens. There is just no possibility that the climate will change in the next five years in such a way as to destroy so much of the American economy as to cause a financial crisis. You can have floods, wildfires, look up. Floods and what we've had floods and wildfires forever. Floods and wildfires do not endanger the financial system. The, this is the, the paradox of climate. They, they're small as far as GDP is concerned. A modern industrial economy does pretty well. There's no flood chance of flooding. Even if we flood all of Florida, that's not going to cause a, a financial crisis. So that is just something people say to each other in order to justify. It's an answer in search of a question. To some extent, they, when they talk about climate risk, they mean, well, it's not the risk of the actual climate changing. We grant there is nothing in any IPCC scenario that says that's even vaguely possible that that would happen. Uh, what they say is that there's the risk of climate policy, uh, that climate policy could strand assets. And so we need to make sure you're not investing in oil companies, not because, not because it's, it's evil for the climate to invest in oil companies, though I think that is the real reason, why not? Because they're not allowed to say that. The financial regulators may not do that. They're not, they're not politically accountable in a, in a democracy. They're not allowed to do that. But the story is there will be, uh, there will be, financial, there will be you know, risk of stranded assets. Now think about what they're saying. Not even I believe our environmental regulators are so dumb as to pass a law that would destroy so much value in the economy as to bring about a systemic financial crisis, meaning you blow through all of the equity, you blow through all the long-term debt, and you're down to a run on the banks. Uh, now, but they are, if they're saying they're saying that is actually a possibility, it, because why? The, the fossil fuel companies are not, they're not, fun, they're not very big. 
You want to know, you know, want to know what's dangerous? Tesla, <laughs> Amazon, Facebook. These are the big market cap companies that are ridiculously overvalued. Fossil fuel companies are, are tiny parts of the S&P. They're funded by equity and long-term debt. They're not funded by short-term debt. And dying technologies have never caused financial crises. 1990s, what caused, what, what caused the big stock market crash in the 1990s? Was it the typewriter companies going out of business? The slide rule companies going out of business? The carbon paper companies going out of business? No, it was the new technologies. The 1929 stock market crash, what caused that? Was it the horse and buggy industry, now a stranded asset because the automobile had invented? No, it was the car companies, it was the radio companies, it was the phonograph, it was the movies. The new technologies are the ones where there was actually some risk. So this story of stranded assets is equally a fable. Why are they doing it? I don't, I don't like to put, to ascribe people's motives. But I certainly know that if you want to be the toast of Davos, if you go in and saying, here's my concern, I'm really worried about mark-to-market requirements on off-balance sheet securities transactions, or you can go to the Davos saying, I'm here to save the mother Gaia from the climate, uh, you get a lot more props for that. Uh, so I, I think there is, in, in climate policy, there's a lot of answers in search of questions. There's a lot of, we have to get rid of fossil fuels from the same people who've wanted to get rid of them for 40 years for other reasons. Uh, that is just not, I'm all, all, the climate is changing. It's a serious problem, but it needs real science-based, evidence-based policies and, and, and not just uh, whatever's fashionable at Davos this year. Okay, thank you very much, John. <laughs>